So welcome to this next iPhotography tutorial where I'm going to walk you through Photoshop's Camera Raw Adjustment. Let's get right into it and let's see what it can do. So to start off, all you need to have is a raw camera file. Uh, so that's basically the image as it's come straight out of the camera, completely untouched and in the native raw file format, not JPEGs. This is all about the camera raw. So all we need to do is just to drag our raw onto screen onto Photoshop and it will instantly open the camera raw window. If for some reason it doesn't, or if for some reason you decide to uh, go back to an image and want to open camera raw at a later point, just to show you, if I close it initially, you have got options for the camera raw filter in the filter menu. So if you go down to the filter menu, just one of the top ones here is camera raw filter. So that's always available if you need to open it in a slightly different way. But generally speaking, when you're opening a raw, it will automatically pick it up. And this is the window that we're going to be working in. So let's expand it a little bit bigger so we can see all the options. Now the image that I've chosen does need a little bit of work. It's quite underexposed, it's quite gritty, it's quite grainy. So this is why using Camera Raw is going to be really, really useful to boost a lot of those attributes, make it much more cleaner before we actually get into any specific editing. So you may ask yourself, what is the difference to actually editing an image in Camera Raw and actually doing it in Photoshop? Well, if you think of them as two separate things, ultimately, Camera Raw is more of a global editor. So this is going to affect a lot of the elements that are within the image overall, as opposed to when you get into Photoshop, you can be making selections and actually making adjustments more finitely and more locally. Now, Camera Raw is, looks very similar and operates on a very similar engine to Lightroom. So if you're familiar with Lightroom, a lot of these sliders, a lot of the tools that we're going to use are pretty much the same. So this is pretty much Lightroom built in to Photoshop. A lot of the time, most people will have both, but um, if you prefer just to work in one piece of software such as Photoshop, you have got the benefits through Camera Raw of being able to use both types of approaches. So this is why it's really, really useful to be kind of using a raw file in Camera Raw because it really is about editing the raw data within the image. I don't think I could say raw any more time, so let's just get into it. So initially we've got a lot of our detail here up in the top corner. This is our metadata about how the photograph was taken. So if you ever need to look back at this information, if you wanted to review how an image was taken and think, nah, maybe I can do something a bit better next time, this is where it's really useful to understand how the image was taken. Um, you've also then got your histogram at the top. So this is straight away telling me the, very Im the image is very, very underexposed, which it kind of obviously is. But this is why we're going to shift some of the attributes and some of the little settings. And you'll be able to watch this histogram change with all the settings that we make. So it's like a live reaction as to exactly how the dynamic range changes within the image. So looking down to the options here. We've firstly got an option here of auto and effectively if we press that, this is the camera raw basically saying, right, I'm going to make all these adjustments for you and kind of automate the whole process to make it quicker and cleaner, which in fairness, it's not done a bad job at all, but it may not be what you want. You may be wanting a high key style. You may be wanting something a bit more gritty, actually and keep it a little bit darker. So edit, you know, the auto is great, but it's not always the answer that you want there. So you can always just press control and undo if you press any buttons by accident. Same again for black and white. Now this basically just converts the image to black and white. And now all the options that we change, some of them won't be available to us. Things like vibrous, uh, vibrant, and saturation obviously because there's no color um, and then if we kind of come down to some other options a little bit further down here where we'd normally have our HSL sliders we've now got a black and white mixer so we can change the color channel still but it's all within the format of black and white so again we've got a few different variations and things to play with around there so let's just kind of click down on one of these drop down menus and we can actually see some of the options here Again, I say if you're familiar with Lightroom, you'll know a lot about these and some may be pretty fairly self-explanatory, but it's good just to have a look at them anyway. So we've got the temperature slider, which is all about color balance. We shift that down to one side to make the image cooler. We shift it up and we can make it warmer. You can type in values at the top here if you know that's specific amounts that you want to be using or specific values if you're following something else. But having it around about, about 5,600 Kelvin, I think that kind of keeps it somewhat fairly balanced at the minute. With the tints, it's the same again. We can kind of tint the image a little bit more to add a bit more green, add a bit more magenta if you prefer. But 
otherwise just keep it back at zero if you're not sure what you're doing. Exposure is probably going to be the most uh, powerful tool that you'll have. Obviously this is like the brightening tool. You can underexpose, overexpose the image. So let's just make it a little bit brighter for the purposes of our tutorial. Contrast again is going to allow us to either crush the density of the pixels or soften them a little bit more. So contrast is actually kind of quite useful in terms of brightening the exposure. So as we see as the image is here, if we reduce the contrast, we're actually making the image lighter simply because we're losing the amount of shadows or brightening the shadows. So that's going to raise the actual exposure of the image overall. And you can see that happening um, on the histogram at the top. So if I go back to where we were and it was more shuffled to the left, if we lower the contrast, it's pushing itself slowly to the right. Obviously, it, does gonna it is going to lose that kind of conflict between the light and the dark by flattening everything out, but it depends on the image that you're working on. We can increase it a lot more and can make it a lot more grainy and gritty. But again, I'm just going to lose a little bit of contrast initially. So the highlights are going to be affecting the brightest parts of our area. So if we shift them up a little bit more, you can see the histograms now just sliding ever so slightly. If I go back... It's sliding ever so slightly to the right hand side. That's going to be because it's increasing some brightness in the highlights area. So specifically, if we just click on with our um, magnifying tool, just this little sticker here, we can see how the brightness reduces and how it increases. So again, you don't want to go too far to end up with spikes um, towards this right hand side and we'll have overexposed areas. But it's good, good to know what the highlight tool can do. So it's good to make brighten things up a little bit more. Same with the shadows. We can slide this left and right. Now there's not a huge amount of shadows in this image, which may seem strange because it seems quite dark, but there is a difference between shadows and blacks. So the shadows obviously are casted by objects that aren't in the sun, or the, the far side of it's not in the sun, so which is creating the shadow. So that's why there's not too much here, because the lighting itself was pretty much overhead on this day. And we're not really seeing much in the way of shadows on the floor. There is a little bit in the foreground here. And if we brighten that and darken that, you can see there's a shift. I'll just come back a little bit further. We can change the amount that was zoomed in and out. So we just localize this area at the bottom of the telephone box. You can see if I move the shadows up and down, we can get more detail from the shot, or we can have less. So I'm just going to lift a little bit more. Right, let's just return to fit into view. Same again with the whites. We can brighten this up a little bit further. So this is brightening a lot of the pixels in the shot here. It's not just the highlights. So you can see even the black areas are getting lighter. So it's pushing the pixels beyond their native capacity. Again, just be really, really careful with doing this so you don't end up with some heavy saturated colors that don't look that natural. So I think around about here, probably be quite useful. Now the blacks, this is again, look, it's picking out all the darker tones. So not specifically shadows, but areas that are quite dark, like the wall on the background here inside the phone box itself. So we're just going to brighten it and darken it just so you can see how it affects the image. So I think it personally, I quite like to brighten the blacks up a little bit more. Don't want it to be too heavily contrasted. So let's move down to a couple of the other panels. Now the, the texture, the clarity and the dehaze sliders are really, really useful for bringing in a little bit more richness and a little bit more detail into your image. So let's zoom in a little bit closer to the edge of the box here. Now, if we slide up the texture, you can see already we've added more contrast, a bit more color and a little bit more grain. So if I slide it up and down, so that's the texture really, really reduced. That's kind of a very low contrasted image, but it's very soft. We've got no defined edges. Slide it the other way, a lot more definition. Now, this can be great if you want to create a slightly more gritty uh, image with a bit more with a look of more dynamic range, but you can sometimes go too far and it can look a little bit OTT. But in this instance, I think it gives us quite a nice grain to the phone box. With it being a little bit old, a bit distressed, I think it's a quite quite the right kind of type of tool to use. So I'm gonna leave that up fairly high. Right, let's with the clarity, we'll go and select a different area. So now the clarity it does that similar idea, but a little bit more globally. So it's not just picking out edges so much. It's pretty much picking out any type of surface or any area of contrast and improving it, or at least improving the contrast to it. So you'll see in these windows of the, uh, of the telephone box here, if we would just reduce it, everything's quite flat. Whereas if we improve the clarity, it's making areas brighter 
it's trying to show some levels of separation. Again, this can, if you go too far, make the image look a little bit more hyper-realistic, which if it's, if it's what you're looking for, it's absolutely fine. But in this instance, I think we can improve it a little bit, maybe about 14, 15. Um, but otherwise, I'm not going to change it too much from there. Now, the dehaze is not necessarily going to work in every situation. This is fantastic for fog, for mist, if you've got that kind of white softening haze across your image. I tend not to use it too much, especially for urban shots like this. It's not overly relevant. But if you see the effect of what it does, if you reduce the dehaze, it's going to add this almost white pale glow to some of our shadow areas. If you push it back the other way, it's going to increase those shadows a little bit more. But again, unless you're using it in situations where you have got haze um, and you're, you're trying to cut down on it, um, things like polarizer filters are way better for it anyway. And to always do it in camera, it was always the better approach, but that's effectively what the dehaze can do. So let's just return that back to zero. Uh, now the vibrance and saturation tools, pretty much is what you'd expect. Saturation is just going to boost the color a little bit more. Vibrance is just going to improve the, the brightness of those pixels as well. So again, depending upon what you actually want to stand out within your image. Remember, these are all global uh, changes that we're making here. So they're not just we're not just selecting one particular color, one particular area. So anything that you do in terms of changing saturation is going to happen to the entire image. So that's the basic panel up there anyway. So let's just collapse that and we'll have a look at curves. Again, if you're a user of Photoshop or even if you've used Lightroom a lot before, the curves will be very, very familiar to you where you can add points on a graph and you can change the exposure just in different areas, whether it be the shadows, which is more towards the left hand side of the graph, the midtones, which is generally in the middle and the highlights. So you can actually see as you move your cursor along the line of the graph here in the bottom corner, it's saying shadows, darks, lights, highlights. So the darks and the lights, they're generally the midtone areas. They've just got a slightly different name for them there. You can also make adjustments using the, um, the, the line at the bottom here, basically to set where those highlights and those shadows and those midtones are for your image. So we can kind of crush the information, we can brighten up a little bit further. So it's really, really playable in terms of the positions that we can actually manipulate in terms of tonal range. Now, if we collapse the curves, we'll go on to detail. So the sharpening tool, it may have been applied a bit of sharpening already. Again, be very, very careful with how you use this. It can be very, very helpful to add a little bit more sharpening and make your image appear that little bit more crisper and cleaner. But try not to go too far because it can have an adverse effect of making your image um, a little bit kind of hyper realistic again. And it can also bring in some grain or some noise as we call it in digital photography. This is why you find the noise option straight underneath the sharpening option there. So if you go really, really high, let's push it right to the, the max on here, you'll see a lot of digital noise occurring upon the sign of the telephone here. We can try and reduce it a little bit, but again, it's only going to serve by reducing the contrast and the clarity of our image. So. We do have to be extremely careful in balancing these two options out. So remember, if you have bumped up your noise reduction feature, it's good to do the same with the color noise reduction as well. Because when we introduce noise, that's going to be introducing color into that noise. So obviously the color reduction will help there a little bit. So try to kind of keep it at a similar value as to the slider above. But for this instance, I don't think we need to have much sharpening. I'd like to think it was somewhat sharp to begin with. If you're uploading images online, don't forget about um, online compression to websites. So it is quite useful to use a little bit of sharpening just to compensate for that. Maybe about 20 or 30% in these instances. Um, it just depends where you're uploading it to really. But um, yeah, try not to go too crazy. Obviously, if it's not sharp to begin with, it's always better to get it sharp in camera than deal with the problems afterwards. Now, the color mixer here, um, this was a black and white mixer and will be a black and white mixer if you're choosing the black and white option uh, from the top of the panel. This is the HSL slider. So this is going to give us the ability of changing some of the colors that are actually within our image. So it's broken down as to hue, saturation or luminance. So you can choose an individual one and just be changing the color. So using the reds, given our phone box was red, we can slide that left and right and we can make it a bit more pink we can make it a little bit more orange. And then if you make it orange and think, no, actually I want to change it again, you then need to go to the relevant color slider for the color of the objects. And now that it's orange, 
we'll go to orange and then we can change it again and then such and so forth so you could be able to ultimately get down to the color that you want if you wanted to make it blue or, or green or whichever so those are all the options there so look around your image have a look for what colors are in there and what colors you want to change so we've got our greens in the background there we can make a bit more yellow we can make a bit more a uh, bit more green or even go into the blue range a little bit so yeah it really is ultimately down to the the styling of the image that you prefer saturation can then be controlled a little bit more individually whereas the global saturation tool we were using before changes the whole image in this instance we can just desaturate that phone box as best as possible now because it's not purely black and white it generally means there'll probably be another color within that red which it may be orange sometimes you may get the odd yellow tones and maybe magentas in red as well but this is how you can play around with it and you can make one object potentially stand out a bit more so say for example if we return that to 100 or sorry, 0 and that 0 and we just desaturate all the other tones in the image we should in theory end up with an image that's pretty much like a color splash we've got these um, brickwork in the background that's still got color and a little bit down in the shadow area there so that's when you'd have to go further into photoshop actually open the document and make some more local adjustments but this is just helping you do it a little bit more quickly now coming down to our next panel we've got the color grading options here now this is a slightly kind of a newer addition into camera raw but this is more finite and it's really really kind of particular it's it's great for color grading an image if you're wanting to make it a little bit more cinematic a very much more stylized i say for a new photographer you may not want to get kind of too heavily into it and i won't go too far into it at the minute because i don't think it's going to be something necessary is advantageous to a new photographer learning about camera raw there's so many different options about being able to tone the colors of your shadows you can tone the colors of your highlights and your midtones so you can kind of create some quite unusual effects um, but it's a little bit more dramatic and it's a little bit more stylized if you're just looking to learn the basics of what camera raw can do for you we're going to look past the color grading and maybe save that for another day now the optics these are a couple of different options here about removing chromatic aberration and um, we've not really got anything like that in this image chromatic aberration tends to come from um, telephoto lenses not being able to focus all the light on the focal plane and sometimes you get a little bit of dispersion of the light rays maybe some like blues and magentas on the outlines of some faint objects in the distance it's quite typical with landscape photography if you're photographing trees at a very far over a very far distance uh, and things like branches are quite small and quite thin you may see these little purple or blue fringes and um, so if you do have that on your images it's quite good just to be able to tick this option so you can remove it it's not perfect um, because it, it can't detect maybe every little aspect and every little occurrence of chromatic aberration and um, because it's just down to the color but it does a fairly decent job when you see it um, now you have also got an option here of profile corrections now this is very very useful if you're using wide lenses and you end up with that type of distortion if you're shooting uh, quite close to a very very tall object and you're using a wide lens you may get that type of distortion where the image gets a little bit wider and a little bit more distorted the further taller it goes so this allows you to correct that distortion a lot of the times um, camera raw is really really good at picking up what camera and what type of lens you've used um, and so automatically it may actually tweak it based upon its parameters or what it knows of the manufacturers as to how much it's going to distort etc um, I've not really got any distortion on this image it was shot at 50 millimeters that doesn't really offer much in the way of distortion but if you're using something around about 50 millimeters or shorter it's really really useful to be using it if you want to correct any distortions so anyway that is in optics now effects um, is another panel that we can have a look at here this is where we can add a little bit more as it says effects <laughs> uh, it's as simple as that in some instances we can add more gray into our image not that we really want to necessarily you don't see it so much on a, on a full length scale but if we go closer in we can add more grit and more grain I think it's more if you want to actually add that type of more textural look to your image and I don't really want to do that too much to our photograph yeah. uh, vignettes are available here pushing them downwards to the left hand side creates a darker vignette we can go the opposite way and create a quite horrendous white vignette <laughs> it's all personal preference I will say um, but yes it gives you that little option of having a, a slight kind of border around the image if you wanted to as well you have got way more options in terms of being able to crop an image 
looking on our right hand side we've got lots of different options after the edit about cropping and we can also then straighten horizons and things like that a lot of those are self-explanatory you've then got the options of spot removal so again this is all very very similar to um, options that you may find in Lightroom if you've got um, areas of an image that you maybe want to touch up a little bit further if we zoom in for example so using our heel brush and all it needs to do is then we can just select the area then Camera Raw is saying to us, well, what other area would you like to replace that area with? So we can just drag this little green marker here to pick out another area and say, oh yeah, actually, I'd like that to be changed instead. And then we may find another area, so we can make it a little bit smaller. And then drag that there, and now it's again saying, which other area would you like to replace that with? So you just need to move the marker to a position that will give you a smoother finish. So you can see between the two now we're actually starting to kind of clean up the edges a little bit there. So you can go over this as, as many times as you like and touch up areas that you think just need a little bit of tweaking and a little bit of improving just depending upon your overall image really. You can change the size of the selection that you're making and the feathering and the opacity of it as well. Now you've got the adjustment brush here and where we were saying before that Camera Raw is all about global editing, uh, which it is primarily, this adjustment brush again like it is in Photoshop gives you the option of being able to make more local adjustments. So if you're not wanting to get too finite and too particular and too designy with Photoshop, you can do more of your local adjustments still in Camera Raw if you prefer. So let's maybe make our image a little bit smaller and we're just going to make our brush size a little bit smaller so we can use a slider or we can use a keyboard so just for example here i'm just going to brush right down the corner of our phone box and that's all i'm going to use in this instance then um, we have got our options to see our mask which is basically showing us the area that we've drawn so we can change the color of our mask by pressing mask and it'll give us an option that let's just choose something that's not red so we can actually see the area that we've drawn there. Now, if we click off that so it's not too distracting, what that means is now all the options and all the um, all the edits that we actually make are going to be based upon that selection area that we've just drawn. So this is why we've got our edit panel again here, but it's called selective edits. So we can darken that and it, you can now see that area that we had, that masked area, has just been reduced in terms of the exposure. So it's just literally selecting one portion of the image and now we're making more localized adjustments to it. So a lot of these things you can do in Photoshop in the main interface, but these are just quite useful for being able to make them in camera raw. If you prefer using sliders, as opposed to any other tools, this is really easy. Now, if you want to go back at any other time, and a lot of this, these icons appear on many of the other panels, you can just press the arrow key that goes backwards so you can just go back and uh, undo everything that you've done but again a lot of those items and a lot of those options that we've looked at already do appear again just for those selective area edits so that's just making more localized adjustments and you have also got a graduated filter and these graduated filters are really really handy for adding slightly more of a, an atmospheric look so again similar to local adjustments where we've just been working on a certain area we can draw that particular area that we want to create a filter across it's really, really useful if you want to make a vignette or, or darken a sky, potentially, if you've not been able to use a graduated filter in camera. This is kind of effectively the same type of thing. So you start off with your green point, and that's the beginning. The red's at the end, and you can drag it wherever you want. You can switch it side to side, so you can add that filter and that effect. Now, that effect doesn't have to necessarily be a dark effect as it is here. I've just reduced the exposure, but it could be a case that we increase the clarity and the texture. Uh, maybe, maybe just reduce the blacks and the whites, just something a little bit more dramatic and gritty. So you can see that it's applied just to the top half of the image and then it'll start to fade out gradually towards the bottom. So if you make it a little bit narrower, obviously it's just going to be this area that's going to affect you can then bring the entire graduated filter into the middle, the middle of the frame. So just anything that falls within this area that we're drawing out here is going to be affected by the changes that we've made on the right hand side. So that's graduated filters and as you'd expect with a radial filter it works in the exact same fashion but it's all about in, in circles. So we can draw the circle out to be bigger or smaller and we can still change it to be more elliptical and more oval. And same again, we can make all those adjustments that just happen within the center area. 
Now you've got the red eye removal tool, which is obviously super specific just to portraits. You pretty much understand kind of if it's actually going to be useful for you or not. A lot of the time, the cameras fire a infrared beam towards your portrait subject when you're taking the picture, and a lot of that time, it actually reduces the red eye. So I don't really find that tool that, that useful to use these days, but just also worth knowing it's there if you ever need. Um, one of the other options towards the bottom is about presets. Now, again, if you've used photo, um, if you've used Lightroom before, you'll be aware of presets. Now, you can actually take those Lightroom presets and now bring them in. They are cross compatible from Lightroom into Photoshop or Camera Raw more specifically. So you can import those if you wanted to. You've got this little option here, this three dot bar, and you can either create presets based upon what you've made so far, um, manage them and change their names, etc., or import them from elsewhere. So I've got a few down here already, so I can just hover over them and then I can just click on them and it applies it straight to the image. Some may work, some may not at all, but the options are ultimately always there to play around with. So if you've got presets in Lightroom that you wanna try out in Camera Raw, you can import them all the same. So that is pretty much Camera Raw for photographers. That's at least a lot of the most basic tools and a lot of the basic features that you can kind of get to grips with and play around with in your image. But for camera roll for beginners, that's pretty much everything we wanted to show you. Hopefully you've enjoyed this little tutorial about Photoshop's camera roll. Thanks very much for watching. Keep looking out for iPhotography for more.